time. What a wonderful time of year. And yet, as I paid attention uh, this Christmas time to various songs and traditions that people talked about, I, I found how odd a celebration it is. There's lots of Christian Christmas traditions that I just don't get. Maybe you don't get them either. I mean, like, who's this King Wenceslas, and why is he in the Christmas story? He has nothing to do with the Christmas story. Or, or the Yule log that Uncle John's supposed to put down. What's a Yule log, and why is Uncle John supposed to put it down? Mistletoe. Google that one. That'll freak you out how that ever ended up in the Christmas story and what his connection is. I'm still not sure, even after reading it. And then there's the one about the figgy pudding. And there's a sit-in about the figgy pudding because until they won't leave until they get the figgy pudding. I don't even know what figgy pudding is and why such a big deal about it to start with. But the biggest one of all is how do you morph the Bishop of Myrna, which is a city in uh, Turkey, a poor bishop who gave gifts to impoverished children, how do you morph that guy into an obese guy who makes a world round, world round trip in one night satisfying all the material fantasies of every child in the world. How do you get that guy from the Bishop of Myrna who was interested in the impover and impoverished and the poor? But there are a lot of traditions, aren't there? Think about the traditions that you have in your family that are unique to you, to your family, maybe to your ethnic heritage. One of the ones that I like the most is, the, is Christmas cards and the uh, particularly Christmas letters or the Christmas picture, the annual Christmas picture with somebody sitting on Santa's lap or there by the tree. I love that one. These are always sent out to fan, friends and family alike. It's, a, it's kind of the annual brag sheet and medical update, you know, all in one. Everything that you wanted people to know. How old are the kids? What's our biggest accomplishments? What are our difficulties, our surgeries, our illnesses? With way more graphic detail, detail than a medical personnel needs to have, but it's right there in the letter for everybody to see. You're going to see now a couple of uh, our families who sent out Christmas cards to me over the last 20 years. And you'll see in these cards that family members change a little bit over time. That's little Paul, the baby up there in the right, uh, left-hand corner, and that's college student Paul in the bottom right corner of that. Terry, can you want to kind of pop those through when they will work themselves, but between slides you'll need to do it. But you'll notice in each of the cards that the, the number of people grows and maybe diminishes. That over time, there are new members that arrive in those pictures, and some members stop making an appearance. Some for kind of the regular kind of reasons, like I don't, it's vanity. I don't like my own picture, so I'm not going to put myself in our family's Christmas. It's always the pic picture of the kids, so vanity might be a part of that. Or maybe more sadly is that people have been absent from the family through maybe death or divorce or distance. The letters and these cards, they tell us a story. Even if that's not their aim, they tell us a story. Christmas is uniquely a family time, and that's its particular blessing. That's my favorite. Again, two kids who are now college students. They're really proud of that. They saw that at the 5.30 service, uh, the picture of them crying on Christmas Eve. They tell a story of a family. And Christmas is, is distinctly a family kind of holiday, isn't it? I mean, its richness is oriented toward family. It's what makes it memorable. It's also what makes Christmas a celebration really for everybody. You don't have to be a Christian to celebrate Christmas. It's a celebration for families. And it's precisely because it's this family kind of situation that it can also be a time of pain or loneliness for many reasons. Time brings changes to a family. Children grow up and move away. Life experiences bring bumps to our lives. We're grieved. Families which were meant to be a blessing might become so dysfunctional that, well, they have to stop functioning as a family. Christmas uniquely tells our family stories, like those pictures told the story of some of those young lives. I want you to think about the traditions 
the habits, the celebrations, the rituals, the parties, the successes and the hardships of Christmas's past. Think about some of those things that you've experienced in your lifetime. No matter how you old you are, you have some track record with Christmases. In my family, we've institutionalized a memory. So in the, in the Great Depression, my family lived in the, the uh, Midwest, Northwest Ohio. They were rural farmers. And the extravagant gift that was given at Christmas was a piece of fruit. That was the main gift. Not just any kind of fruit, it was citrus. Now, in the fro frozen, glaciated territory of Northwest Ohio, citrus was like exotic, a real rarity. And so to get it on Christmas morning in your stocking was a true treat. And every Christmas, they would get pieces of uh, this citrus put into their stockings. Well, one particular Christmas had to be in the 30s. My Aunt Riva, they all had farm names too, my Aunt Riva, they must have stuffed the citrus into her sock way too early. So by Christmas morning when she opened it up, the lemon had shriveled and dried. It was almost a rock. It wasn't supposed to be a joke. It wasn't supposed to be mean. It wasn't right up there with giving a piece of coal. It's just what happened. It kind of dried up in the period of time when they had stuffed the sock and stuffed it away in safekeeping and hiding. But every year since the 1930s, someone in my family at Christmas time opens a package and it's the lemon. <laughs> every year. Now, it's not the same lemon. Don't get all you know, mythological. I mean, it's got to be a different lemon because that lemon was already in bad shape in the 30s. So I'm sure it's seen many, many transitions of, of lemons. But the lemon tells us about hardship. It was the depression. It was the big gift. It tells us about a family that tries to bless, and yet things go haywire on them. And now it's a part of the fun, a part of the celebration, a part of what it means to be a part of our family story. And if you're an in-law and you get that lemon, you know that you're now part of the family. It helps us to remember the ordinary and the spectacular things that have happened to us in our story. It's really beautiful. Christmas is about a story, yours, mine, of course, but it's centered on the story of someone else's family, the family of Joseph, Joseph and of Mary and their newborn son, Jesus, we don't give dried out lemons to the baby Jesus or the Holy Family, but we do give all kinds of other stuff at this time of year, don't we? We decorate with lights. We cut down perfectly good living trees. We drag them into our house. We put candles on a dying tree. Some of these things aren't making much sense. We have created a whole cottage industry of creating artificial looking real trees to put lights on and to make glad a celebration of Christmas. We do all sorts of things around this holiday. We may not give lemons, but in the midst of it, we remember our stories. We remember our family story. We remember the hardship in our family story, and we remember the hardship on that first Christmas Eve when the firstborn son of Mary and Joseph arrived in the middle of a forced census, taxes again, when they were traveling and they couldn't find appropriate lodging and had to find a place outside of an inn, in a barn, in a stable. And of course, there were all the ordinary things that we hear about and all the spectacular things that we hear about in the Christmas story. You know the story. We heard it again tonight from Luke 2. You know it as well as I do, and you could probably tell it if you've been around Christmas for even a couple of years. It really is kind of a a beautiful story. Christmas in your family, Christmas in the Holy Family, it wasn't a perfect first Christmas. They would have taken a Motel 6, but they couldn't even get that good. It was a barn. It wasn't a perfect Christmas. And yours probably isn't going to be a perfect Christmas either. So before it even starts, you might as well get over that. But it can be beautiful, and it can be meaningful if we accept 
this moment, this Christmas, as a gift. And if we love it, and if we cherish it, not for its mistakes, its missteps, its mishaps, but because those things are a part of our story, because sometimes, sometimes it's precisely those hard times and the years of rotten lemons that become the beautiful thing for generations to come. We just don't often see it when we're in that moment. It can also be beautiful if you know that this Christmas, the first one and this one this year, is not the end of the story. Baby Jesus, if you haven't been with us since last Christmas, let me bring you in on a little secret. Baby Jesus doesn't stay a baby. It's remarkable. He doesn't stay in that manger. In fact, the manger thing, the whole food trough, that probably lasted about one night until the midwives and other women around and the other moms saw what was going on and made that right. But we, of course, fix it in an icon in porcelain and set it in our manger scenes forever. Jesus stayed a child about as long as you stayed a child, about as long as your children stayed as child. Not long enough. His story is moving on. So is your story. Jesus, Christians believe, was God's purpose put in motion in the world. Jesus was God's idea. From the very beginning, we read in John 1, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Later in John, it points out that that Word is Jesus, this little baby in the manger, the Word that was with God from the beginning. His idea about moving it forward was in God's mind all along. God was waiting for the right moment, just the right time, to move the story positively forward with divine purpose. And that's why we celebrate tonight, isn't it? God's purpose moving positively forward in a story that begins new things and in new ways in the town of Bethlehem. But it's a story that has not ended yet. I mean, we're still here celebrating it. They are still writing songs about Christmas. You'd think over 2,000 years we'd written pretty much everything you could imagine, but no, we just keep writing new songs from the sublime to the ridiculous. Why does grandma not get out of the way and every year get hit by the reindeer? From the sublime to the ridiculous. We're still carrying on about this Christmas. We're still wondering at it. We're still piling on traditions and memories. Christmas can be a beautiful event for us if we also will nudge forward in positive ways God's purposes in our lives if we also enact Christmas. We believe the first Christmas happened so that the world would know the depths of God's love. We would find reconciliation. We'd find forgiveness, not just with God, but with one another. We'd meet a God who does not demand sacrifice from us, but instead, like a good loving mother or a great father, a God who would sacrifice for us. And that's a colossal difference, eternally securing us with him. So this Christmas, I want you to spend a little bit of time, and I want to invite you to move your story forward positively with grace. First is to recognize that this Christmas is not the end of the story. It's just the beginning of the good news of the great joy that the angels talked about that has been pouring out for the last 2,000 years. This child lives and dies and rises again from death to new life to show us that no story is ever done. God isn't finished with us yet, and God isn't finished with your story yet. And that's the good news. It's the great news of great grace, especially if you're a person with illness or a person that's grieving or a person that's end, uh, come to the end of their rope, to hear that maybe this isn't the end of the rope, maybe all hope is not lost, because God continues to be with us. I want you to think tonight about how you can make a difference, a little difference, just to nudge a little grace forward. And you'll see in your, your bulletins, unless you got the recent copy, and then you don't have it, and I'll give you one afterwards, you should have a card in your bulletin. Do you have a card in your bulletin? Looks like that. Wasn't a mistake. I didn't forget to send them out. They're not just stuck in there. Go ahead and pull it out. Are you still with me? It's not even midnight yet. Still got 20 minutes. 
I'm not going to preach that long. <laughs> Pull your card out. That's why I put this card in the bulletin tonight. I want you to think seriously about the one place that would move your story forward more positively and with divine purpose. One place, one person, one event, one set of circumstances, one situation. Maybe as I say this, you're thinking about someone you need to contact or reconnect with, to reconcile with or to forgive or to seek forgiveness from, someone who needs the touch of human love, someone who's lonely or hurting, in need or is impoverished, someone who is maybe serving us tonight, keeping us from harm's way or protecting us or mending us, they're working while you're sitting here at midnight mass, if you will, or tomorrow when you're drinking your eggnog and relaxing and they're at work doing all those things behind the scenes for you and I. I want you to choose just one person or one circumstance and I want you to reach out to them. That's why I gave you a blank Christmas card because Christmas isn't done yet. The story isn't over. And there's some person in your life that needs to be nudged forward by God's graciousness given through your hand and your heart and your life. Who is that person? And what is that circumstance? Oh, I know. I can already hear you saying, but, but, but you don't understand the circumstance. You don't understand the person. Oh, I do. And so I invite you to pray over it and to do the courageous thing and to do the hard thing. You see, what, what happened on Christmas, we, we make it so pretty and we make it so porcelain when we make the nativity scene, but the fact is, is what happened is that God chose the hard way and not the easy way. If it would have been me, I would have stayed in heaven. Sounds like a pretty good time. But to come to earth and to know what's going to happen to you and what we did to him was outrageous. He did not choose the easy way. He chose the hard way. Why did he choose the hard way? So that we could be nudged forward by his grace and by his mercy. The hard way, you see, is what buys redemption for you. The easy way would not. And so I know your situation it won't be solved in a single night. It won't be solved by a single contact or a single Christmas card. But it may move it forward positively. And maybe something very human and something very ordinary, like maybe a new life, something new happening will happen in that situation. Or maybe something truly spectacular will. By our actions, perhaps people who are searching and searching and searching who can't find that thing like the Magi on that first Christmas, will, by our nudging, be able to find it. Maybe instead of no room, which seems to be the mantra of most of the world, more room will be created in the world for God's love. Maybe a little more light will shine in the dark world. A bit more grace will ease the burden of one who's living a harsh life. Maybe you can begin to move the rest of your story forward positively with God's purpose beginning tonight to live a life that's marked more by forgiveness and reconciliation and peace seeking and justice making and love giving than by the taking that we often aim at at Christmas. So let's make it a Merry Christmas. That's up to us. It will be Christmas. But let's make it a Merry Christmas. Not just a materially successful one. I'm sure that one's already in the bag. But let's make it a Merry Christmas. Like that first one where the good news nudged in to human existence, where redemption was born in a hard place, where hope took life, and where God moved forward into us with purpose, with presence, and with love. Be courageous. Be courageous. It will be all right because God is with us.
and may you make it a very merry Christmas tonight. Amen.